Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to uh, the Environment and Public Works uh, Committee. We're going to have a, it's like a two-part show. The, the beginning of it, we'll uh, do, uh, have a short business meeting, consider the, uh, the nomination of Jeff Barron to serve a third term as commissioner of the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And uh, once we've disposed of, of his nomination, uh, we'll turn to uh, our hearing. Uh, and we've been joined by Shailen Bott, who is the head of the National uh, Highway uh, 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 Administration. We w welcome him and others who've joined us. Uh, we need, um, I think, uh, we, we've all, I've got enough people to start talking. And uh, I think we will get like a few more people will be able to start voting on, on Jeff, uh, Jeff Byrne. I thank everybody for, thank everybody for, uh, for coming. Um, or over the course of his uh, tenure, uh, Jeff Barron has played a critical role in ensuring that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission maintains its status as the world's gold standard for nuclear regulatory agencies. People ask me what the NRC does. They ensure uh, safety with respect to all these nuclear power plants across the country that are providing about, uh, I think, half the carbon-free electricity uh, for our country. I commend uh, Commissioner Bott for, Commissioner Barron, rather, for his efforts to help safely advance our energy security and address climate change through the work of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, these uh, include ensuring the safe licensing and operation of carbon-free nuclear technologies, such as the next generation of nuclear reactors and fusion energy as well. Uh, Mr. Barron has uh, also worked to provide opportunities for engagement and input from all stakeholders, especially those in disadvantaged and underserved communities. In addition, maintaining a full panel of commissioners will help the NRC to continue to carry out its responsibilities effectively and efficiently. And with all of that in mind, I will vote yes on Jeff Barron's nomination. I urge our colleagues to join me in doing the same. Let me yield at this point to Senator Capito. Senator Capito, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we are here again this morning to consider, as we heard, the renomination of Jeff Barron to serve as a member of the Nuclear uh, Regulatory Commission. Two weeks ago, the committee supported the bipartisan accelerating deployment of versatile advanced nuclear for clean energy, the ADVANCE Act, by a resounding 16 to 3 vote. So we are committed to the ADVANCE, advance Act, which will help position the United States as the undisputed global leader of nuclear energy, including the next generation of advanced reactors. Commissioner Barron's nearly nine-year record shows that he is not the right person for the NRC, especially at this critical time for nuclear energy and the emergency of new technologies. His votes and positions simply do not align with enabling the safe use of nuclear technologies that the NRC is expected to undertake in the coming years. Throughout his past nomination processes, he has a history of telling the committee he supports advanced nuclear and then not doing so once he's in office. I will not belabor the point now, but I believe that it has been made before, including at the last business meeting. Um, instead, I ask unanimous consent for my opening statement from our last business meeting, and as well as a letter of opposition from several pro-nuclear uh, organizations to be entered into the record. Based on his record, Without I objection. will oppose his nomination. Thank you. Without objection. All right. All right, let me just say my thanks to uh, everybody for, uh, for joining us today, and, and uh, we'll uh, uh, address the, the nomination of, uh, of uh, uh, Commissioner Barron to, uh, to serve another term. And uh, all right, got a quorum, so let's get started. Uh, I call up a presidential nomination uh, 547, Jeff Barron of Virginia, to uh, continue serving as a member of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I move to approve and report the nomination favorably to the Senate. Is there a second? second. It's been moved and seconded. Kirk will call the roll. Bozeman. No, by proxy. Mrs. Capito. No. Mr. Cardin. Aye. Mr. Kramer. No. Mr. Ferryman. Yes. Mr. Graham. No, by proxy. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Lummis. No, by proxy. Mr. Murphy. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Padilla. Aye. Mr. Moses. No, by proxy. I just recovered from both of these. Mr. Riggins. No, by proxy. Oh, I'm here. 
Excuse me. Mr. Sanders. Aye. Ms. Davenant. Aye. Mr. Sullivan. No, by proxy. Mr. Whitehouse. Aye. Mr. Wicker. No, by proxy. Mr. Chairman. Aye. The nine of the nominations favorably reported. My thanks to everybody who's changed their schedules in order to be here so we can get uh, this done. We're now going to have the hearing with uh, Shailen Bott of the Federal Highway Administrator. Thanks, everyone, for coming, for joining us. This uh, concludes the committee's uh, votes as part of the business meeting today. I thank uh, all of our members for your participation. I'll now recognize any member who would like to speak on the matter we have voted on. Did anybody want to speak on what we just uh, voted on? The nomination of uh, Mr. Barron. Hearing no, uh, no requests. Um, in closing, I'm delighted that our committee has uh, voted to report to the Senate the nomination of Jeff Barron to continue to serve on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit Additional materials related to this morning's vote uh, for the record, including letters of support for Mr. Barron's nomination. I also ask unanimous consent that the staff has the authority to make tactical and conforming changes to the matters approved today. Uh, I, I, I would repeat those unanimous, that unanimous requ uh, consent request. Is there objection? With that, no. I'm hearing no objection. With that, our business uh, meeting is adjourned, and uh, we're getting ready to start the second half of a day-night doubleheader. Hopefully it won't extend into the nighttime. I don't think it will. Uh, with that, uh, I'm pleased to call this hearing to order. Wel welcome to all of our uh, witnesses. Welcome to um, uh, our guests. And a special thanks to uh, Senator Capito and our colleagues for being here for this important, important hearing. Today we're here to discuss the Federal Highway Administration's implementation of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. It's um, it's so I'm enormously proud, and I know Senator Capito is as well, the work, work that this uh, committee did in uh, literally, literally providing the foundation for the bipartisan infrastructure law. People say to me, and I'm sure they say to you, Senator Capito, uh, when you tr travel back to West Virginia around the country, why can't you guys and gals just work together and get stuff done? And as it turns out in this committee, that's what we do. We reported out the, uh, our parts of the bipartisan infrastructure legislation unanimously, 20 to zip. Uh, 10 Democrats, 10 Republicans, and uh, we're proud to help lay the foundation for what's turned out to be one of the biggest inf investments in my nation's infrastructure ever, ever, and it started right here in this room. So I think we've made some history, and hopefully we'll continue to make that, that, that history going forward. Um, before we begin, I want to take just a moment to acknowledge the disaster that occurred this past weekend uh, just north of Philadelphia. My, my wife and I live about five, five miles from the Pennsylvania line, so this was uh, too close to home. And uh, the, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of work that's been going on, and I know uh, our, our witness today, uh, Shailen, has, has been up there uh, for quite a time, and we'll hear a little bit about that uh, as well. But on Sunday, a tanker truck uh, carrying some 8,500 gallons of gasoline caught fire on the off-ramp uh, causing an overpass on I-95 literally to collapse, as we've probably all seen on television. Administrator Bott, who also is, goes by Administrator Bat, but I've always called him Administrator Bott, has uh, already been to the site of the crash, I think a couple of times. He and his team are working to support state uh, officials there as they seek to restore mobility on this critical quarter for our nation. I call uh, I-95 is sort of like our nation's highway. It goes all the way from Maine all the way down to Florida, and the amount of traffic on that, which goes through my, my state, is just incredible. I want to thank um, our administrator and the rest of his team at the Federal uh, Highway Administration for the important work that you are doing. We appreciate very much you being with us today. It's been a little more than two years since this committee unanimously marked up the highway bill that would go on to serve as the foundation of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And when we did, we uh, noted that it included historic funding for our nation's highway programs. I also noted that it was included the first ever climate title in a bill of that nature. In our highway bill, we created the Promoting Resilient Operations for Transformative, Efficient, and Cost-Saving Transportation, also known as uh, the PROTECT program. We did so with the intent of improving the resilience of our transportation systems and reducing our vulnerability to extreme weather. We've all heard of the old saying, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's certainly the case with investments in resilience. 
Building the protective features and natural infrastructure helps keep transportation assets uh, to withstand disasters for years. And the earlier those protections are in place, the greater the benefit will be. With that in mind, I'm pleased that the Federal Highway Administration is now accepting applications for the first round of the PROTECT grants. It's my hope that the Federal Highway Administration works quickly to award these programs funds and help begins to improve the resilience of the commodities, uh, communities rather, nationwide. Our bill also creates dedicated programs to develop electric vehicle or EV charging networks across our country. It also includes a 70% increase in funding for programs to build safe, accessible pedestrian and bicycle pathways across our country. In addition, our service transportation bill authorized the Reconnecting Communities program. This was the first ever federal program to address the safety and pollution impacts of highways that are divided and hurt neighbors, uh, neighborhoods in many places across our country. Importantly, not only did our highway bill focus on the critical issues of climate, uh, safety, and equity, but it did so in a lasting bipartisan way. To my colleagues who heard me say Shailen a million times, bipartisan solutions are lasting solutions. We're very proud that that's the approach we took with the bipartisan infrastructure bill. But during uh, that markup two years ago, I also noted that the uh, infrastructure bill alone was not enough to address climate change. And once we passed the bipartisan infrastructure law, we got to work on legislation that eventually became the Inflation Reduction Act. Inflation Reduction Act authorized several new programs under the purview of the Federal Highway Administration. And this included a program to reduce the industrial emissions from construction materials as well as funding to facilitate efficient environmental review and permitting times. The Inflation Reduction Act also provided funds to mitigate air, noise, and water pollution and other uh, impacts to federal, uh, 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 other impacts on highway infrastructure on disadvantaged communities. And together, the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act uh, represent the most significant investment in clean energy and transportation infrastructure as well as equity and climate resilience in our nation's history. Still, there's no shortage of work that remains to be done. There are key questions that the F Federal Highway Administration must address around implementation, around regulation, and guidance. And that's why I'm delighted here to welcome our friend, uh, uh, not just from Delaware, but a friend who's actually been Secretary of Transportation in Delaware, in Colorado. He's worked with, uh, I think, with USDOT and any number of other responsible uh, positions to prepare him for this day. Uh, this is the first, uh, his first time before our committee since the Senate confirmed his nomination to be administrator of the Federal Highway Administration by a voice vote in uh, December 2022. We look forward to hearing your testimony today about the extensive work that you've led in the last uh, six months or so. As I've noted, uh, Congress provided the Federal Highway Administration with historic funding and uh, the authorities necessary to revitalize high highways across our country. The agency must also use its regulatory authority to address ongoing needs. One such need for regulation is to help reduce emissions from our uh, transportation sector, which account for nearly 30% of our nation's greenhouse gas emissions, the largest single source in our, uh, our economy. As my recollection, 30% of our emissions come from the cars, the vehicles, the trucks that we drive, cars, the mobile sources. Another 30, 25% comes from our power plants across the country. And another uh, roughly 20% comes from our manufacturing base or manufacturing operations. But the biggest of those three is our roads, highways, and bridges. Last uh, July, the Federal Highway Administration proposed a rule that would require states and metropolitan areas to measure their performance on greenhouse gas emissions and set targets to reduce those emissions. Once finalized, there will be, uh, this will be a critical tool to steer infrastructure investments toward better climate uh, and, uh, outcomes, and I hope that the agency will move quickly to final, finalize that rule. And finally, I'd like to uh, emphasize the importance of improving safety. Last year, nearly 40,000 people tragically lost their lives on our nation's roads, the highest number in 16 years. I'll say that again. Last year, nearly 43,000 people tragically lost their lives on our nation's roads, the highest number in 16 years. The U.S. Department of Transportation has taken an important step toward this goal by releasing the uh, it's a National Roadway Safety Strategy, which sets a goal of zero 
fatalities for U.S. roads for the first time, zero for the first time. Still, there's more uh, work to do uh, that the Federal Highway Administration can and should be doing to prioritize safety. That includes working with states, working with metropolitan areas, plan stay streets that are safe or safer for all users and, and choosing highway designs and roadway designs that don't encourage speeding or other unsafe behavior. With that, we look forward to hearing about the, the work that Administrator Bott has done and will continue to do to advance uh, these uh, priorities. Before that, I want to return to our ranking member, Senator Capito, whose leadership was critical to the passage of the infrastructure programs we're discussing today. Senator Capito, you are recognized for as long as you wish to speak. Thank you, Chairman Carper, for uh, calling today's hearing and your ongoing willingness to co uh, conduct oversight on the IIJA and the Inflation Reduction Act. Administrator Bott, it's very good to see you. Uh, I know that you've been extremely busy here over the last several days. Since your confirmation, you have maintained a very open line of communication with me and my staff, and I want to express uh, our appreciation for doing that. I also want to thank your hardworking staff at the agency. I know they're working a lot of, on a lot of different issues. I would also like to acknowledge the tragic uh, incident on I-95 in Philadelphia. The pictures are just overwhelming, and I know you've been on the ground. I appreciate the responsiveness of the FHWA in providing assistance to the state of Pennsylvania. I know the investigation is underway and Congress will be provided more information when it is available. Um, I'm very proud that this committee, as the, as, the, as the chairman said, developed the legislation that served at the foundation of the IIJA. And we did so together uh, and bipartisan through regular order. I was proud to manage the uh, bill on the floor with the chairman and to attend the signing ceremony at the White House. Unfortunately, our bipartisan product was jeopardized by FH, this is before you got there, FHWA's December 2021 policy memorandum, but I want to thank you, Administrator Bott, for issuing a substantially revised policy memorandum that superseded the original one. I appreciate that you recognize the original memorandum diminished the bipartisan accomplishments of this committee and contradicted the statutory text and clear intent of the Congress. When the IIJA was signed into law, we promised the American people that the legislation would deliver results by improving our nation's core infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure, and we we're starting to see real tangible benefits uh, of that investment. In negotiating the legislation, I prioritized the inclusion of a robust project delivery and process improvement title that included the codification of the one federal decision policy for surface transportation projects. I look forward to receiving an update from you today on how the agency is implementing those provisions and others in the IIJA. Proper implementation of the law is the only way to see the full benefits of the IIJA. So now on to the inaptly named Inflation Reduction Act, which has not and will not reduce inflation. Following the passage of the IIJA, the administration embarked on a partisan exercise to pass what I believe are misguided policies through the budget reconciliation process. That effort began with the introduction of the so-called Build Back Better legislation in 2021 and culminated with President Biden signing the IRA into law in August of 2022. The original version of the reconciliation legislation included a provision that would have directed FHWA to establish a greenhouse gas emissions performance measure and associated targets. I challenged that provision as violating the Byrd rule of the Congressional Budget Act, and that provision was stripped from the legislation. That removal of language was the second time since I became a ranking member of this committee that we have dealt with this policy. And that was the second time that Congress directly rejected FHWA the authority to establish a greenhouse gas performance measure and associated targets. Providing this authority to FHWA was also debated and ultimately left out of the bipartisan IIJA. The Biden administration through your agency is now attempting to impose the chairman just talked about this, impose a, a greenhouse gas emission performance measure and associated targets on state departments of transportation and metropolitan planning organizations without any authority from Congress. This rulemaking feels very similar to the December 2021 policy memorandum. Yet again, this administration is trying to implement partisan policies they wish had been included in the IIJA and the IRA through agency actions. I'm hopeful that under your leadership, this rulemaking for greenhouse gas performance measures and associated targets will not move forward. 
On a related note, I also want to express my concern with the proposal that the President's fiscal year 2024 budget request has. The budget request included legislative language that would repurpose $60 million in unobligated contract authority from the TIFIA program to the Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program. This is in the weeds, but I know you understand what I'm talking about. The IIJA did not provide contract authority for that program. It received an authorization, but it is subject to appropriations. This committee determines what programs receive contract authority and how much, not the department. I hope this is not something that your agency plans to pursue, as once again, the committee has already made a decision here. Finally, I want to raise an issue that is not directly related to either of the laws we are discussing today, but may have significant impact on how state DOTs manage their programs and their ability to move forward. I'm referring to the $3.5 billion discrepancy in contract authority between the two fiscal management systems known as FEMAS and Delphi. I appreciate that you brought this issue to my attention in January and look forward to receiving an update for you on how the DOT plans to resolve this discrepancy. In summary, the topics of our hearing today starkly contrast the different outcomes in quality and durability. We get great quality and durability when the Senate pursues bipartisan legislation through regular order. If we compare that to a partisan legislation through budget reconciliation process that I believe falls short. Nevertheless, oversight of your implementation of these two laws is a critical function of this committee. I would like to take one moment to um, say farewell to a much beloved and incredible uh, member of our staff over here, the Republican staff at EPW. Lauren Baker will be leaving us um, I, I don't know if it's today or tomorrow, but way, way too soon. And uh, she has been, she really helped to shepherd the IIJA through, uh, through our committee. She is an incredible resource. I know she'll be successful where she goes, but Lauren, we will miss her. And uh, I know your department will miss her as well because of the great give and take that we've been able to have uh, with her and through your department. So thank you for letting me bid Lauren a fond farewell. Um, Lauren, thank you for, uh, for your work. One of the joys of working in this committee is working with our colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And it's not just member to member, but uh, staffs uh, as well. And uh, to, to Adam and to, uh, to Courtney and to members of our respective staffs. So thank you for that great, uh, great spirit. We send the example. Uh, we all heard of trickle down, trickle down theory. And uh, it also, when, when uh, the leaders of a committee like this work together and, and reflect that kind of behavior, uh, you know, the, the staff picks up on it as well. And it's it's a good thing for for us. So Let's I would. Let's give her a round. Lauren, stand up. So yeah. Can. All right. <laughs> where, where, do you know where Lauren's going to go next? Where's she going to go? Private sector. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, before I uh, before I uh, turn it over to uh, Shailen Bot for his testimony, I just would note I. Uh, I want to drive into the train station in, in Delaware this morning. I was listening to NPR News, and they were giving us some, some updates. They, they announced that with respect to you know, the IRA, so people see the IRA well, it does, it doesn't really help reduce inflation. But then they, uh, in the morning news this morning, we just learned that inflation continues to actually uh, drop. And I think the, annual, the annualized number is now down to 4%. Uh, 4%. Uh, and uh, the last the job creation number we got to just report out of the uh, Department of Labor a couple of weeks ago, and the new, new jobs, 340,000 new jobs in the last month, and our unemployment rate for the country is still holding down around 3.5%, which is a pretty darn good number. And uh, it's not perfect. There's still things we can still do better, but uh, the, uh, that ain't bad. And where I come from, that ain't bad. All right. Thank you, Senator Capito. We'll now hear from our witness, uh, Shailen Bott. Shailen pr pronounces his name Bat, but a lot of us in Delaware pronounce it Bot, and Bot and Sold. Uh, like a batter at the batter to plate, but uh, they, they'll answer to either one. But he's the administrator of the Federal Highway Administrator Administration, uh, sworn into his current role on January 13, 2023, after being unanimous again, and uh, unanimous confirmed by the Senate on December 8th of last year. As administrator, Mr. Bott oversees an agency that with more than uh, 2,700 employees, which includes staff who work in all 50 states. Uh, U.S. territories as well, and the District of Columbia to carry out federal aid highway uh, programs. Uh, welcome, uh, Shailen. Uh, you may now proceed with your testimony. And thanks um, for joining us. 
Thank you, uh, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss implementation of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, otherwise known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, these historic investments in our nation's infrastructure and new opportunities to build a clean energy economy that create good jobs and lower costs for working families. When I appeared before this committee for my confirmation hearing, I noted that FHWA staff uh, have been working tirelessly. I have hit the ground running since being confirmed and the dedication of FHWA staff in carrying out these laws and getting real results for the American public is inspiring. I've always said that a transportation agency exists for two reasons, to save lives and to make people's lives better. This past Monday, uh, I joined members of the Pennsylvania Congressional Delegation as well as the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation Secretary in touring the site of the partial collapse in Philadelphia that occurred on Interstate 95 involving a truck fire which resulted in the tragic loss of life. Uh, the I-95 corridor is a vital connection for people and goods traveling along the East Coast. FHWA has offered support and assistance to state and local officials to help them safely reopen this section of I-95 as quickly as possible. We are working diligently with our divisions in all surrounding states, as well as with our sister agencies on emergency relief support and maximizing all best practices. Having led the Delaware Department of Transportation through the I-495 bridge emergency in 2014, I am critically aware of how important an artery I-95 is for the state, region, and nation. Every day of closure will affect people and uh, freight on this vital corridor, and we are laser focused on working with our partners to get the road open as quickly as possible. In addition to our commitment to safety, FHWA's work is guided by an initiative we refer to as Driven for the 21st Century. There are six aspects of this initiative, delivery, resilience, innovation, values, equity, and our nation. Each of the six, six aspects of the Driven initiative guide our efforts to implement the many programs and funding opportunities authorized by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Delivery is the first aspect of Driven. Thanks to these acts, we have the funding necessary to make major improvements in our transportation system. FHWA has taken numerous actions that will support implementation of projects that improve safety and people's lives, including distributing more than $120 billion in highway formula funding to states and issuing notices of funding opportunity for approximately $4.6 billion in available funds. We're also administering nearly 900 awards totaling uh, 7.5 billion across nine discretionary programs. These are more than just numbers. These dollars means project that will improve both safety and people's lives. FHWA has a long-standing practice of engaging with our stakeholders and providing technical assistance, but we have placed an even greater emphasis on these efforts since the passage of the legislation. FHWA is committed to supporting our stakeholders at the state, tribal, and local levels, and we have specific efforts in place to provide training and technical assistance. Resilience is an important part of building a modern transportation system as it will help us keep our infrastructure strong and fulfill our most important duty, getting people where they need to go and getting them there safely. FHWA has already made significant progress in carrying out many funding programs that are specifically targeted at addressing climate change, including distributing funding under the Protect Formula Program and Carbon Reduction Program and publishing a NOFO for the Protect Discretionary Grant Program. Innovation is essential for the future of transportation infrastructure. It will help us tackle a broad range of issues such as improving safety, increasing the resilience of our infrastructure, and finding new ways to combat the climate crisis. The current round of FHWA's Everyday Counts program supports innovation specifically aimed at climate change concerns, safety, and equity. While the tireless service of FHWA employees is evidenced by the quality of our transportation system, we are also responsible for the members of our agency. FHWA is committed to all of our core organizational values and caring for our staff. Equity is one of FHWA's primary values and drives every one of our programs, projects, and initiatives. Not only do the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act include programs specifically intended to address equity issues, but the historic investment in our infrastructure will benefit those who find well-paid work rebuilding their communities. 
And every aspect of FHW's work is driven by the people and the nation that we serve. We must create a transportation system that delivers for our economy and all of our people while getting individuals and goods safely to their destination. A transportation system that literally unites us as Americans. Driven will allow us to deliver results for both the US transportation system and Americans as a whole. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thanks for, for that testimony. Um, I'm going to start our uh, questioning by uh, asking you uh, about the re recent uh, disaster that took place just north of, uh, of us in uh, Pennsylvania uh, on I-95 uh, near Philadelphia. And I know uh, that from our conversations that you spent a fair amount of time there in, in the days since, uh, since then. Um, I understand that Governor Shapiro is, is making an announcement uh, right literally in real time as we're gathered here today and that you might uh, be in a position to comment on what he's saying a little bit later in our, in our, in our hearing, and I look forward to that. But uh, to start off, could you just please talk with us uh, this morning about the role that the Federal Highway uh, Administration will play in coordinating with state and local agencies to respond to the bridge collapse and restore a sort of movement of goods and people around the Philadelphia region while this uh, bridge is being rebuilt. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Chairman Carper. And, and as you and the uh, ranking member mentioned, uh FHWA staff have been working tirelessly on bill, and I, I just want to highlight that in addition to standing up this law, which has been uh, a lot of effort, uh, you know, we also have to deal with the sort of um, uh, the business of keeping the federal highway system up and running. And I just want to highlight for um, uh, the committee that on Sunday when the calls started coming in, we had dozens of federal highway staff uh, here in D.C., in Pennsylvania, just on calls all day long, and uh, I just want to thank them for their efforts. Uh, I I did. I showed up in Philly on Sunday, met with uh, PennDOT. I mean, the Secretary Carroll has been doing an amazing job of really marshalling uh, the people there. They've got all the experts that they need. Uh, we are acutely aware of the impacts uh, that this closure is having, not just on the city of Philadelphia or the state of Pennsylvania, but the region and the nation. Uh, Secretary Buttigieg went, uh, went to visit yesterday and got a, a briefing. The president has asked for uh, daily briefings on, uh, on this project. So so uh, every lever that we can pull is being pulled. We uh, released uh, quick release funds last night uh, for $3 million uh, for the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, the bulk of uh, uh, the, this, these costs will be covered by the ER program. All right, thank you. Just as a follow-up, are there any initial takeaways that we can learn from this disaster that might help prevent similar disasters in the future? Uh, well, I think, uh, Senator, uh, I think, you know, you are keenly aware of this and members of the committee that just how critical our transportation system is. And I think sometimes we take it for granted that it just operates. And then when something like this happens, uh, uh, it becomes very apparent uh, why these investments are so important, why this infrastructure is so important. Uh, and so uh, I would say I think uh, it will be important to wait for the NTSB investigation into the cause uh, and, and learn uh, any lessons uh, that we can. But uh, uh, I think that uh, I, I just feel like uh, having been in a lot of those meetings uh, over the weekend uh, and into yesterday that uh, you know, truly, when you when you just have all of these engineers trying to solve a problem, and you have all of the experts in the room, there's just a, an amazing energy and and unified focus. And I think uh, you wouldn't be able to tell who were Democrats and who were Republicans in the room there. And uh, you know, I think that's uh, emblematic of of infrastructure solutions. That's great. Thank you. Um, my second question, then I yield to uh, Senator Capito. Uh, deals with VMT uh, uh, pilot, vehicle mile, miles travel pilot. For more than a decade, federal fuel tax revenues were not kept up, as you know, with, with transportation investment needs. A dozen states have used federal funds to study uh, vehicle uh, miles traveled fees, and those pilots are showing some success, as you know. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law directs uh, US DOT to create an advisory board on funding alternatives and to undertake national study of VMT uh, fees. The goal of that work is to produce uh, meaningful data that uh, would provide timely input for the next reauthorization bill. Given that uh, deadline, it is essential that the work begin and begin uh, quickly. Unfortunately, neither the advisory board nor the national study have been established yet. My question is, what is the timeline for the federal Highway Administration setting up the advisory board and getting the national study underway. Uh, 
Thank you, Senator, and uh, I am aware of your uh, uh, interest in this uh, particular program dating back to when I was the secretary in Delaware and was uh, part of the mileage-based user fee alliance. I'm not a Johnny-come-lately on this issue. Yes, uh, and in Colorado when I was the uh, vice chair of the Western Road Usage uh, uh, Consortium, Road Usage Charge Consortium, uh, and so uh, we are going to work expeditiously to get the uh, advisory committee uh, set up and we'll uh, make sure that uh, we get this important data uh, for the committee as we look to reauthorize the program. Great, thank you. That's good to hear. Music's my ears. Thanks very much. Senator Capito. Thank you. Um, in my opening statement, I talked about the, uh, the debate that we had over the greenhouse gas emissions performance measure and targets uh, that we had rejected it here in the Congress, and you are pursuing a measure in a, uh, that would uh, achieve this through uh, rulemaking. What is your response to what I said in my opening statement, and what authority do you have to be moving in this direction? Do you believe you have? Uh, thank you. Uh uh, ranking Member Capito, and, and before I address that question, I, I would also like to echo uh, your comments about Lauren. We will miss her <laughs> grace oh. and uh, professional uh, knowledge. Um, so uh, I, I would say my reaction to your comments is I hear you and I heard you during my confirmation hearing uh, about your concerns uh, about the GHG piece. Um, uh, from the authority perspective, obviously we have uh, lawyers at Federal Highways who will examine that, lawyers at USDOT. Uh, I believe MAP 21 did uh, provide authority to measure the performance of the transportation system. Uh, and I think we are in an open rulemaking right now. We've received, I think, uh, 40,000 comments um, from folks. and. Before we move forward in that rulemaking, we would want to uh, understand all of those public comments. Okay, so we could. I think we. I probably need a little more clear on what authority you. But we'll, we'll follow back up with you on that. Um, let's go to the FIMSA Delphi uh, discrepancy that is definitely in the weeds, but very impactful for many states, including uh, the smaller states. Um, we had asked about this, uh, how are you gonna address this? And the quote that came back was, once the task force has completed its review, USDOT and FHWA will determine the type of adjustment required and the applicable authority. Seems like the apple, you know, we're getting, we need the authority before we can make the decision. Where are you on this issue and where's is the task force work? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, uh, specifically on the FEMIS Delphi uh, issue, um, yeah, as soon as I became aware that I, did, I, I we have been in close contact with right. states, uh, we did establish a task force. I think they are diligently working through all of the uh, potential uh, impacts here. Um, I think when you have an issue of a three point five dollar, three point five billion dollar discrepancy, we want to make sure that we have uh, looked uh, at, at every angle here. And so I am. Uh, hopeful that we'll be able to provide you a little bit more detail uh, soon, but uh, just my, I guess my update here would be that we are working towards getting a resolution as quickly as we can. Okay, so I mean, would that be end of summer or end of the year? Or? Uh, I, I would say uh, as quickly as possible, uh, definitely this year. Um, I just, I, it's some of this r w involves other uh, coordination, and so I just want to. Okay. Um, but we will continue to be in close contact. Okay. Okay. It looks like I'm over my time by three minutes, yeah, but it yeah. doesn't. Yeah, 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 I don't. I don't feel like I've been that long. <laughs> so I'm going to ask one more question. Feels long to me, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. We'll switch. <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> In January, NTSB Chair uh, Homendy raised concerns about the safety impacts of electric vehicles uh, on our roadways. I mean, in looking into this, the realization that these vehicles weigh a heck of a lot more than uh, gas gasoline uh, vehicles do. And so we reached out to FHWA to ask how you're planning to look at this from a, fu a future safety of our roadways. I'm sure it's going to have impacts on... Um, um, on uh, not just bridge safety, guardrails, and also impacts. Our response from them was, uh, from you, was while FHWA doesn't currently have any research planned on how the weight and weight distribution of EVs may impact guardrails, bridge safety, and the longevity of the highway, safety is number one priority. We know that safety is number one. Why does the agency not have any planned research in this area as we're being pushed in this area to move towards the EVs? Uh, 
Thank you, Ranking Member, for that question. Uh, I, I, I will double check uh, where we are in terms of research. I mean, size and weight is something that we take a look at, particularly with regard to bridges, um, and the performance of guardrail is obviously something that we would want to right. understand uh, the impacts. Um, just as a, as a personal example, I have a, a minivan that has a, an electric battery in it, and it um, I would want to, again, verify, but I feel like it's in the same weight range, uh, but particularly as freight and some of these class eight haulers uh, become electrified, that is something. So what I will do is I'd be happy to come back uh, for you and uh, get you some specifics you. around our research. Thank you. I mean, this issue is raised by our state DOT that uh, they're concerned about what kind of impacts uh, this could have on highway safety. So we'll follow up with that. Thank you. Administrator Bat, uh, first of all, welcome. It's nice to have you here. This past week, the Maryland uh, Federal Congressional Delegation had our annual meeting with Governor Moore. He was here with his cabinet, with Secretary Wiedefeld, uh, and uh, they were very um, uh, optimistic and very thankful for the support they've gotten from the federal government uh, in the new programs. And uh, the, the governor specifically mentioned the concerns of communities that have been adversely impacted from transportation programs and the use of our funds in order to deal with that. We had the um, reconnecting communities that's being implemented. But he also indicated that as we build new transportation programs, we need to be more sensitive to community needs. And part of the infrastructure bill was a significant increase in the transportation alternative program, 10% of the formula funding. Can you just share with us how you are administering that program to make sure that the intent of Congress uh, to help communities deal with transportation challenges under the Transportation Alternative Program is being implemented? Uh, thank you, Senator Cardin. And uh, um, we have heard from communities uh, across the nation, including in Maryland, how excited they are uh, about the opportunity to transform uh, their communities. I'll give you one very specific uh, example. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, complete streets, which are an important part of, you know, active transportation and transportation alternatives. Uh, as an example, we have waived the local match on planning uh, requirements uh, around complete streets for communities who want uh, to, uh, um, to be able to access these funds but may not, uh, you know, have the local match or the uh, planning expertise uh, in-house. So uh, that's one example. I think uh, Transportation Alternatives is a very important program, one that I've uh, deployed in Delaware and Colorado and uh, uh, happy to, uh, to provide further details to your office. I uh, Thank you. One of the areas that we are looking at is how we can deal with traffic safety, including the use of Transportation Alternative Program funding. Uh, I've introduced uh, uh, legislation, uh, or I'm working on legislation that would honor Sarah Langenkamp, uh, who was a distinguished foreign service officer and a constituent who was killed while riding her bike in Bethesda. Uh, legislation is being authored to allow the, the more liberal use of our funds for highway and traffic safety, including the TAP program. We see the increased numbers of safety uh, episodes of injuries and deaths on our highway. Tell me the urgency of your efforts to deal with traffic safety. Uh, well, sir, I, I, uh, I remember when I became the secretary, the director of the Colorado DOT, we had 484 fatalities. Uh, when I left three years later, we were over 714. Uh -huh. 10% increase year over year, the vast majority uh, among vulnerable road users. And for me as the uh, steward of, uh, of the Federal Highway Administration and our role there, I, I take every one of those fatalities uh, incredibly seriously. Um, we, we want to make sure that safety is out there and available for people who want to take alternatives like biking, like walking. And so uh, it is a, a, an imperative for me as the Federal Highway Administrator. So one of the challenges we have in multimodalism, which is a way in which we can really improve safety as well as convenience and a more efficient highway and transportation system, uh, is to encourage more multimodalism. And we have that in our state. The challenge is that we have stovepipe funding in many cases. So it's hard to coordinate a, a, a multimodal uh, forum. Tell me the efforts that you're making in order to encourage that type of 
transportation cooperation, which is in the best interest of our communities? Yeah, I, I think I think that the uh, Senator, thank you for that question. I think the uh, this is a primary focus for Secretary Buttigieg at USDOT, bringing in all of DOT uh, approach. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, as communities are reaching out, um, whether it is federal highway funds or FTA funds or rail funds, uh, as we ex as an example with reconnecting communities, that we are looking at it through a multimodal lens, so that the solutions that come out um, are are the best ones for those communities and not a, a federally prescribed approach. Thank you. Senator Kramer. Thank you, Senator Cardin, and thank you, Senator Capito, for uh, this very good and important um, hearing. I, I'm, Mr. Administrator, th thanks for being here. And I, I'm going to drill down a little more. I'm going to go back to Senator Capito's concerns about the proposed rule. A and not, not only the lack of authority, I, I believe there's a lack of authority to do it, but also on the practicality of it. And, uh, but first, first on the, on the authority side, why? Before I get to why it's not going to work in North Dakota or other places that aren't going to require commuter buses or, or subways. Um, the, in the Inflation Reduction Act, it dedicated $27 billion for a green bank, something that the EPA withdrew almost immediately after getting the, you know, the authority to do it. And they created instead of this sort of slush fund for grants. Now, there's nothing new in the law that expressly prohibits such a thing. And this is sort of the, this has been the tradition of decades <laughs> of administrations, Republican and Democrat alike. To take the absence of a prohibition in a law that authorizes certain things as a license to do whatever's not prohibited. But I, I want to speak to two really big recent Supreme Court cases that using the major questions doctrine, stating emphatically that agencies don't have authority that isn't given them in law. Um, and, and that, of course, the, the first one being West Virginia versus EPA, and then the, the other one being the, the WOTUS rule. Now they're going to take up maybe a Chevron doctrine um, issue, and we'll see how that, how that turns out. So I just, I think it's becoming increasingly clear that the bureaucracy is, n is not a fourth branch of government, that our policymakers. First of all, I'm, so I want to ask you, what do you, what's your sense of the actual authority to do these things? But secondly, I do, I, again, I want to stress that it's impractical in places, rural places especially. We're, we just aren't going to build subways in North Dakota to get people to their farm. Um, and so I would hope if this is going to proceed, I'd rather have you withdraw like you wisely did um, with the previous um, you know, memorandum. But... But short of that, I hope there's consideration for the uniqueness or this, you know, the different qualities of different places uh, across our very diverse country. Senator, I uh, thank you for that uh, uh, question and, and statement. And I, I, I guess I would frame this, uh, you had sort of a two-part uh, mm, right. piece there. So on the legal authority, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I start virtually all of my meetings within Federal Highways is we will follow the law. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have lawyers on staff, and I, 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 am, I take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I don't want to opine as a lawyer. I just I will follow the direction uh, you know, that our lawyers give us on, on following the law very clearly. I, I hear you on the, uh, the impacts, particularly for rural states and others around this piece, and yeah, not likely to build a, a subway around Devil's Lake. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I would... I, I, would, I would simply say here uh, on this piece that this bipartisan infrastructure law did have a climate change title in it. Um, and from a performance management perspective, right? Like when I was in Delaware, we wanted to, it was hard to get folks to talk about performance management, bridge condition, pavement conditions. I think what we're trying to look at here is not sort of penalize states for their greenhouse gas emissions, but just get them to begin tracking greenhouse gas emissions as a if if this is if 30% of our GHG is coming from the transportation sector, this is the piece of it, and maybe it's not a subway, but maybe it's alternative fuels like other things, uh, electric vehicles, other ways to drive that down. So uh, I, I know it's become a very, very political hot button issue here, but as with most of my efforts, I, I try to just focus on the here's what we're trying to get to, and we'll follow the law, um, but not to be punitive, but more from a tracking perspective. And I, and I appreciate that, but I also, on this particular topic, for example, while there, there, there's a, a, a title that relates to the basic issue, 
we discussed this specific issue uh, and decided not to do it. In other words, it's, there's not a lot of ambiguity about the intent of the Congress in, in, in this legislation. So again, your lawyers will duke that out or they'll find some way around it and eventually we'll, you know. But here's the, uh, here, it, short of the Supreme Court weighing in specifically on a lawsuit on a rule that's so far not a rule, um, so I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, but I think we have to consider that if we're gonna be this sort of general with our authorities at the administrative level, the next administration might be of a different persuasion and take that, that slush fund at the EPA and say, hey, let's build a wall with solar panels at the southern border. And, and, you know, I, I mean, just it seems extreme and it probably is, but there's a lot less extreme examples that I could probably come up with that I think, you know, Democrats would find objectionable for good reason. So with that, I just I appreciate hanging in there with the law. Um, I always dismiss the lawyers after I get their advice before I make big decisions. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pott, for being here. Um, I would offer a different view than my distinguished Republican friends. Um, I think that if Congress specifically authorizes you to do something, then that's good and you have a clear direction from Congress. If Congress fails to specifically authorize you to do something, then what you revert to is your innate executive authorities. And if Congress wishes, it could forbid you to pursue those inherent executive administrative authorities, which they've done with things like um, Republican-driven efforts to prevent the IRS from policing political dark money. So there are examples of doing that. I don't think it's correct to say that when Congress considers a specific authorization and then doesn't pass it, that failure is a lawful restriction on your ability to do what you need to do using your uh, innate administrative powers. And as a state, which has a coastline, uh, which we believe is going to intrude quite far on our current seaside and bayside boundaries, predictably in years ahead. We're looking at very significant changes to the actual map of Rhode Island. So dealing with climate change responsibly is a deadly serious matter for my state. And I would strongly encourage you to pursue your greenhouse gas performance measures to the full extent of your executive authorities. It matters to states like mine that you get this right. And whatever pressure there is to the contrary, please remember those of us who are highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, to the ocean acidification, to the ocean warming, to the sea level rise, to the coastal erosion, to the air quality effects, all of that. And uh, I offer that as a contrary view to what Congress intended by not authorizing you. Um, the bridge investment program, is that going to get another round of funding? Are you going to have another round of applications? Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. Ye uh, yes, uh, bridge investment, uh, there will be another round that, uh, that comes out, uh, I believe, this summer. What's the timing for that, more specifically, if you know? Uh, it, in the, uh, uh, this, more specifically, like other than this summer? Like, yeah, like do you have a date uh, or a month? Uh, ju July or August. Sometime in July or August? Yes. Okay. And so you'll be accepting applications during that period for that second round? Yes, sir. Okay. Good to know. Um, thank you for that. Um, I think that's all I have. Let me recognize uh, Corey Baba from... Newport, who's with us. Good to have a Rhode Islander in the house. And uh, look forward to working with you to support you in every way possible on the uh, emissions dangers and having proper information in order to assess and address those dangers appropriately. There are many, many, many Americans who are counting on you to make the right decision, not the one that the fossil fuel industry wants. Thank you. Uh, Senator Merkley, we are waiting for Senator Ricketts, but we'll go with Senator Merkley. 
there's so much going on, so we're going to have a lot of in and out here. <laughs> I thank you very much, and I uh, uh, appreciate your, your testimony and, and your work. A couple questions. I wanted to start with the um, uh, issue that has been brought up in, in my state. Uh, Oregon's in the Cascadia subduction zone, and there's a lot of preparation for essential infrastructure to survive the big one, if, if you will. And uh, we have been told by the Department of Transportation that they don't consider the need for seismic resiliency as relevant to a number of the grant pool applications. And um, that, that certainly is a concern. We're working to uh, rebuild uh, one of our, our bridges to make sure that there's at least one bridge that survives. And can you speak a little bit to why seismic resiliency is, is not considered a, a factor for you all in a number of these grant programs? Uh, thank you, Senator. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm always made aware when I travel to the West Coast and in these seismic zones, the just difference in bridge piers, uh, you know, and, and the size of those piers um, as compared to non-seismic activity. I, I would want to double check on that. I know that the Golden Gate uh, a large bridge uh, investment that was made of around $400 million was a seismic retrofit for the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and that was a, a critical piece of that uh, funding. So I, I would want to double check that um, where that uh, where we stood on that. Okay, I'd, I'd love to follow up with you uh, in regard to the specific project and the concern that is relevant to the multimodal project discretionary grants, the bridge investment program, and the raise grant uh, program. And because uh, a bridge may be functional now, but if we don't have any bridges that survive a, a quake, uh, then uh, addressing the, the emergency at that time is, is a, a real challenge and, and thus uh, trying to responsibly reinforce key infrastructure. I want to turn next to um, a project that really began uh, with Lamar Alexander of Tennessee, who served here previously. And they developed a program in his home state where along the highways they did pollinator plots uh, and had different clubs maintaining different, different pollinator plots. Uh, and our highways create an enormous opportunity to address the, uh, basically the pollinator Armageddon. Uh, we've lost massive numbers of uh, butterflies and, and bees along our highways. One of the species that catches the public attention is the western monarch. Uh, the western monarch went from a high of about 10 million 40 years ago uh, down to as low as 2,000 butterflies uh, two winters ago. And it's, it's had a couple good years, and then it had the huge storms in, in overwintering site in Southern California uh, back uh, this uh, late winter, early spring this year. Another huge hit. And uh, that, that uh, uh, pollinator uh, butterfly, it travels uh, four generations to go north, one generation to go back south to, to California. Nobody sees monarchs in Oregon anymore. They think they see them, and they're actually seeing like the yellowtail butterfly because it's at least <laughs> it's not orange, but it's yellow. So hey, close enough. Maybe I saw a monarch. And uh, and the bigger issue uh, is that we could really have clubs sponsor plots of land along our north-south corridors just as Tennessee did along their, their highways. And we got this uh, bill, the Pollinator Friendly Practices on Roadsides Highways Right of Act, into the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, but you all haven't stood it up yet. Uh, and it's really an opportunity for uh, folks to directly participate in establishing uh, plots uh, uh, along these major corridors that would assist with all kinds of species. And, it's, and I, I mentioned the monarchs, and people think, well, milk, milkweed. Uh, yes, uh, milkweed is essential for the, the female butterflies to lay their eggs, but they need, the adult butterflies uh, need um, uh, the pollinator flowers, just like other uh, pollinators uh, do, and um, so it would help a whole lot. Are you, are you familiar with this program, and um, can you tell me um, how the stand-up is going? 
Uh, well, thank you, Senator. And uh, I, I remember when I was the Secretary in Delaware, we had a bee truck overturn on 95 and uh, uh, millions of bees and uh, just uh, tr trying to make sure that we were able to get that to a successful ending because of the importance uh, of pollinators. Uh, I, I would want to double check and then come back to you exactly where we are in standing up uh, that program, but I hear you uh, on the importance of ensuring that, uh, you know, from an agricultural perspective and just uh, from our uh, natural environment that those pollinators are critical. You can imagine hundreds of clubs saying, just like they adopt a mile of highway now to keep it clean, saying, yeah, we want, we want to do a little, uh, we want to go seed uh, pollinator nectar producing flowers uh, and milkweed, and and um, and contribute to uh, a, a major opportunity to use the sides of our highways that um, uh, are otherwise um, just not contributing much. But but there is a perfect possible connection. And uh, finally, uh, I just wanted to in, encourage uh, the the work to roll out the EV uh, charging stations. Uh, and the, I think the model for this program is that it has to be as easy to charge up as it is to fuel up. And if you've driven an electric vehicle any distance, you're probably aware that that's often not the case because of the great complexity of the different uh, charging technologies that are out there by different companies. I really push the Department of Transportation to have a national standard so uh, it is as simple uh, to charge up as it is to fuel up. Uh, how do you see that program going? Uh, well, thank you, Senator. Obviously, uh, uh, the President has set uh, uh, a goal of 500,000 chargers, uh, and, and I agree with you. If we're going to be successful uh, with the uh, EV rollout for the American public, that they do need to be able to charge as easily as they're able to fill up. Um, I, I think that uh, I would give the... Uh, 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 committee credit for the investments that are being made uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure law. We're actually seeing the market moving now with the big announcement between Tesla, Ford, and GM, and lots of other uh, companies now looking to move that standard. So I, I think that that is a very positive outcome, uh, and hopefully one where we can continue to see consolidation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before, before I uh, turn to uh, Senator Ricketts, I, uh, I apologize for being out of the room. We have hearings uh, going on in other, uh, other uh, committees. And, uh, in the Homeland Security Committee, in which I serve, uh, they're having actually business of writing votes. So they need to drag me in there every, every now and then, so I apologize for leaving. While I was out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the room here, there was some discussion, and I, I just want to make a comment, if, if I can. In, in, in my absence, I would have said something else if I'd been here. But there's been a fair amount of discussion on greenhouse gas a performance measure and the fact that the bipartisan infrastructure law did not amend the performance measure section of uh, law in order to require a greenhouse uh, gas measure. Um, and I would note that uh, my own recollection is that our committee actually did consider a provision that would require a stringent uh, greenhouse gas performance uh, measure while also exempting half the states in the nation from that measure. We declined to include that language in favor of retaining the existing authority to set performance measures for environmental sustainability, which include greenhouse gas uh, emission. And that uh, authority was created by MAP 21 in 2012, and I'm glad that the Federal Highway Administration is uh, using, still using that authority. Thank you. All right, let me yield now to uh, Senator Ricketts for his questions. Go ahead, Senator Ricketts. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Chairman Carver, Ranking Member Capito. Thank you for being such a faithful atten yeah. attendee. No for, problem. For My pleasure. I, I, I told you I love this committee. Uh, we do, too. <laughs> All right. So my first question, Administrator, is it bat or bot? Uh, whatever the pleasure of the committee, but generally bat. Bat. Okay. Administrator bat. First of all. But, but, but the, the uh, guy who's from Delaware. I Delaware, heard Delaware. Uh, well, I used to call him bot. Bot. Bot and sold. <laughs> So first of all, I, I do want to thank uh, your team for the relationship with the Nebraska Department of Transportation. Prior to me, uh, I was governor, um, I got sworn in 2015. Prior to that, I think it was a pretty poor relationship between our uh, Department of Transportation and um, Federal Highway Administration. And your team has really helped repair that. And I know that uh, you know my first director, Cal Schneeweiss, through John Selmer, now Vicki Kramer, appreciate the working relationship. So thank you very much for continuing to build upon that relationship. It's really important that we continue to work very closely between 
Federal Highway Administration and the State Departments of Transportation. So I, I really appreciate that. And I just also reiterate what Senator Capito said about making sure that our agencies take legislation that we pass and faithfully execute that legislation in the way that Congress intended it to be implemented. So thank you with that. And with that, I'd like to jump into the Infrastructure and Jobs Act and talk a little bit about the August redistribution. So I believe for fiscal year 2022, the August redistribution jumped up to $6.2 billion. And I think with the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, we can expect to see that August redistribution continue to climb. However, as you know, there's a very limited amount of time then with which departments of transportation, specifically the Nebraska Department of Transportation in my case, can take that, uh, get that money back and re redeploy it efficiently and effectively. And as that number becomes larger, that's gonna become an increasing challenge. And we wanna make sure obviously those dollars are spent effectively. What do you see with regard to that August redistribution and how can we make that process one where Departments, of, you know, state departments of transportation will be able to have access to that money and be able to use it in a way that is not going to be inefficient. Uh, well, thank you, Senator. And uh, yes, your first uh, director that worked for you had a much more challenging last name than mine. Uh, <laughs> you pronounce uh, and, and spell too. Yeah, that but Kyle is a is a dear friend, uh, and and grateful that we are rebuilding that relationship uh, in Nebraska. Uh, look, you raise a very important issue, uh, Senator. The August redistribution, uh, in addition to the FEMA Delphi issue, when I came in in January, one of the first things that we did, we sat down with uh, Ashto uh, at the TRB meeting in January uh, to say that listen, we were at 6.2 billion last year. We're going to be higher. We generally notify states in July of the impending. August redistribution numbers. We've been in close contact with the states uh, since basically March, saying this is coming. Please get ready. Uh, you know what can we do to help you? What flexibilities uh, can we get there? Our goal is to, uh, and I know the Ashto goal, and and even within communities within those states, is to make sure that all of that oblim uh, does get used, and that is uh, our one of our very primary focuses uh, in the next few weeks. So is there, are there additional flexibilities or specific uh, flexibilities that you have in mind to be able to give state DOTs so that they can again employ these dollars, especially as they get bigger in a more effective way? Uh, Senator, thank you for that. Yes, uh, I, what I, I say, and this is always very important for me, I, I say we, we have to follow the law. Right, but let it's us, a good thing, always it, follow the law. It, absolutely follow the law, but for each of our division administrators, when you are working with all of those states, whether it's West Virginia, Delaware, Nebraska, um, if the state has a creative idea, that says like, hey, we might be able to apply some of this oblim on a project here and they have contract authority. Uh, we wanna work and then going forward, I think this is something that uh, because of the size of the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, if August redistribution is going to be at this level, um, it might be something we wanna look at a, a legislative fix uh, going forward. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Also in relation to the IIJA, you've got these discretionary grants. And one of the things I'm hearing from folks in my home state is about the process, especially if you think about some of the uh, smaller localities that would uh, be, be able to apply for some of these grants, the challenge of getting through the application process. Um, what sort of resources do you have or do you think you can do for some of these localities to make it easier, um, specifically navigating like the BIL launch pad, for example? I've heard some challenge with that. Again, especially for smaller communities. What can you do to provide extra resources or make the process easier for those communities to be able to apply for these discretionary grants? Uh, thank you, Senator. And uh, you know, I, I think what we want to make sure is that for all of these communities, whether they're large state uh, uh, DOTs or cities or smaller communities, we want to get them an award and then also get them across the finish line with a successful project. Yeah. We have uh, uh, LTAB, Local uh, Technical Assistance Program, Tribal Te Technical Assistance Program. We've set up um, websites. Uh, the Secretary's Office is very engaged. So uh, if there are specific communities you'd like us to reach out to, we'd be happy to do that. Oh, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that offer. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn the time back over to you. Very nice. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, Senator Marks arrives. Senator Ark, you are recognized. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. By. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Ambassador Bat, it's good to see you uh, again. And uh, just want to come back to our favorite subject, the Cape Cod bridges, uh, and uh, the, the need to ensure that now that they're nine months older than the last time you testified, um, that they are in even more desperate need of replacement. 
And if a severe storm were to strike Cape Cod, um, extremely worried that the bridges will become a bottleneck for residents and visitors seeking to evacuate, creating a very severe safety risk. So can you reaffirm um, your commitment to working with me to replace the Cape Cod bridges? Uh, thank you, Senator, and uh, just as in my confirmation hearing, now I know them as the Bourne and Sagamore bridges, not just the Cape Cod bridges. And after Brent Spence, this is, these are probably the, uh, the bridge projects that I've, I've heard quite a bit about uh, in coming in, and absolutely, um, this is a priority focus for our administration, and happy to continue to work with you on it. Yeah, it's just um, so important. It's the only way off of Cape Cod. Okay, so when that storm comes, and it's coming, just the evacuation will be catastrophic if, we, if those bridges aren't there. Um, the highways and roads of the past splintered and displaced communities, and as we drive into our clean energy future, we can't green light more inequality. We have to put those injustices in the rearview mirror. In cities like Philadelphia, Chicago, New York, majority white census tracts are more likely to have electric vehicle charging stations. And we're reckoning with that in Massachusetts. In Boston, most EV charging infrastructure is located in the Seaport, Fenway, Beacon Hill. But neighborhoods like Roxbury, Dorchester, and Charlestown have limited to no options. Um, that's why. Last Congress, I introduced the Community Vehicle Charging Act, which would invest in EV charging infrastructure in environmental justice communities. Intentional and equitable deployment of electric vehicle charging must be a priority uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure law implementation. And one way that Boston is increasing access is by, is by deploying chargers in city-owned parking lots in low-income and black and brown communities. So, Administrator Bat, how does the charging and fueling infrastructure discretionary community charging program help cities and states to tackle this conundrum of making sure that the charging stations are in inner city communities? Yeah, thank you, Senator Markey, and uh, the significant uh, investments uh, in electric vehicles uh, that this uh, committee put forward in the bipartisan infrastructure law. We are working with uh, states on their NEVI programs and ensuring that, you know, that they are adhering to the um, uh, the standards that we have put in place. Uh, CFI actually just closed uh, the discretionary grant program on June 13th, so we are anticipating opening all of those applications, and that is a critical lens for us to make sure that we not only have the uh, interstate uh, interstates covered, but also all of our communities uh, and the, the very communities that you mentioned in your comments. Okay, thank you so much. Very, very important. And uh, do you think mobile charging has a role to play in the charging and fueling infrastructure program as well, particularly to provide resilience to charging systems in case of emergency. Uh, thank you, Senator. Yeah, I, I think that uh, you know this is a very exciting time in this nascent industry. Uh, it's one that uh, I think uh, the president is very clear he wants America to lead in, and so we're going to look at an all of the above approach to make sure that this transition is successful. Yeah, and technical assistance is going to be very important for frontline communities to be able to apply for the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, programs and for the Inflation Reduction Act um, uh, programs. Uh, is the Federal Highway Administration supporting communities so that they can make the most of these funding opportunities in frontline communities? Uh, thank you, Senator. Yes, I think what is um, a, a both a blessing and uh, and a new burden is the fact that while we have traditionally worked with state DOTs uh, to administer this program, there are many many direct recipients, and so we again, as I said before, we want to make them successful in getting an award and also cutting a ribbon on that project. Thank you. And finally, I was proud to secure forty five million dollars in the twenty twenty three omnibus for my active transportation infrastructure investment program, which promotes walking and biking infrastructure and supports active transportation networks that allow people to safely travel without a car. And those active transportation networks reduce transportation emissions, increase mobility. Um, so now that the program is officially funded, the Federal Highway Administration needs to deploy those funds as quickly as possible. So can you commit to swiftly 
implementing my active transportation infrastructure investment program. Uh, yes, Senator. Uh, I think everyone uh, within Federal Highways knows that I am a huge um, supporter of active transportation. Thank you. And Senator Sullivan and I, we partnered <laughs> on that, and it's just, um, it's just amazing how much Alaska and Greater Boston have in common. Uh, and uh, in, in that partnership, we can just see a future that works for everyone. Thank you. Uh, you say Shailen um, Markey in Sullivan, uh, Massachusetts, Alaska. It's a, mar a marriage made in heaven. And so, Danny, well, <laughs> Sen Senator Sullivan, you're on. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm over here kind of cracking up because Senator Markey was mentioning um, um, his bill. I was just going to say it's really our bill. But I mean, he's the lead, but I think I was your lead Republican co sponsor on that. But so I saved that. You did. It was I, thought I, I thought I did a good job of digging you, out of the hole I was did. in. You know? So, so <laughs> I, I saved it. So thank you. I'm, but, Administrator, you're seeing some very um, important bipartisanship here. And I do want you to spend all that $45 million from our bill, particularly there's a project outside of Anchorage called Moose Loop. And um, if you can take a hard look at Moose Loop, um, this has a great potential. It's right up the alley of what Senator Markey was talking about. So uh, that's my, my first uh, issue I wanted to raise with you. Uh, have you heard of Moose Loop yet? Uh, I have now, sir. Okay, now you have, right? <laughs> right. So in, we'll Boston, in the Boston Public Guidance, we have make way for the ducklings. Well, so maybe, you know, it's not yeah, moose. It's, it's the same concept, <laughs> just maybe a little bit bigger animals. Um, so uh, thank you, Senator Markey. In, in all seriousness, it's a, it was a great legislation. I was very honored to co-sponsor it, and um, I think it's going to benefit a lot of people across the country. So we'll send you we'll send you info on Moose Loop. Um, let me get back to uh, another issue uh, that relates to Alaska administrator. We still got to get you up there, right? Uh, it is uh, it is on my uh, list. Uh, Probably more summer than winter. Okay, uh, but we'll do That's moose right. loop together. Moose loop, we can do that for sure. That's a good idea. Um, I want to talk about another part of the infrastructure bill. I did vote for the infrastructure bill, um, which was the Protect program, and that's about resiliency. You know, Alaska has more coastline than the rest of the lower 48 states combined. So when you talk about resiliency. For coastal America, we're over 50% of it for the whole country. And you might remember, it didn't make a lot of press back here, but last uh, fall, the west coast of Alaska got hit by a typhoon, Typhoon uh, Murbach, a uh, very big storm that did a lot of damage. And our state DOT has been working with FEMA and your agency on faster ways to complete the repairs to the damaged infrastructure that took place after this um, typhoon. So I'm just wondering, what are you doing to implement the PROTECT program, particularly in the coastal communities in America, but in my state, given, like I said, that we constitute over 50% of all the coastline in America? Uh, well, thank you, Senator Sullivan, and uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, whether it is a typhoon hitting uh, Alaska or flooding in Kentucky and West Virginia or, um, you know, there's just no shortage of weather events uh, that uh, are testing the resilience of our of our system. And I remember being in Juneau a couple of years ago for the WASHTO uh, events and seeing hearing about some of the impacts of sea level rise and uh, climate change there. I was just recently at the WASHTO event and met with the Alaska uh, director of the DOT, oh, good. deputy DOT, and uh, talking about the very unique um, coastal aspects uh, uh, and needs. Uh, so specifically with PROTECT, um, we have distributed the funds uh, to the states through the formula program and have also launched the discretionary uh, program. So happy to uh, visit with you if there are okay. any discretionary opportunities, uh, but share your concern and, and the importance for that program. Okay, good. Let me, um, let me mention another topic that I know you, you and I have talked a lot about. Senator Capito has been leading the charge on here in the Senate. And that, of course, is the ever endless goal of so many of us, including a lot of my Democratic colleagues, on permitting reform, right? We have a system that is just dysfunctional, 
that it takes forever to get projects, whether roads or ports or bridges or mines or you know, energy projects off the ground. It hurts the country, hurts workers. It's just, and it's self-inflicted. So the infrastructure bill has uh, some decent permitting reforms we negotiated here actually in this committee. Not enough in my view. And then so did the debt ceiling agreement. And so uh, I have two, two uh, parts to my question. One is, um, what are you doing to implement those? Very bipartisan, we wanna keep them going. Certain groups in America don't like it, but they're definitely in the minority. And then second, with regard to permitting, one of the most egregious things that I've seen that really, really kind of is starting to put us in the world of you know, Venezuela and banana republics is, um, and I've seen it a lot in this administration, particularly as it relates to Alaska, we had a number of projects that went through final EISs, six, seven years, millions of dollars, got record of decisions from the previous administration, professional federal employees doing that. In this administration, the Biden administration, has come back and is looking at all these records of decision on infrastructure, on roads, in Alaska saying, you know, you didn't consult enough, so we're gonna reverse that. So literally opening up records of decisions that are four years old. I mean, this is just nuts. It's, in, so any views on both of these views, uh, both these issues relating to permitting in general, and then reopening records of decisions that are four years old. I mean, that's not the rule of law. It's not America, but the Biden administration is doing a lot to my state and it's outrageous. Uh, so uh, th thank you, Senator, for the question. I would say on the, the first part, having um, been a state DOT uh, secretary in two states, uh, I have anxiously awaited a record of decision or a finding of no significant impacts. And um, as a project delivery person and coming from the private sector, uh, before I took this job, I, I am, I am always resolutely focused on the critical path. How can we deliver these projects uh, on time and on budget? Uh, and from a federal highways perspective, uh, recognizing that we are not a permitting agency. We're the ones who are actually going to our sister agencies uh, who do issue the permits. However, we do have great relationships with Army Corps, Fish and Wildlife, and so um, I think we're trying to leverage those relationships to try to get uh, um, the, the important reforms that have been put in place. Uh, in terms of opening records of decision, uh, I, I'd love to visit with you um, offline about that because, uh, as I say, we, we, we want to follow the law, and, uh, and that is my commitment that we will do that. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, and Senator uh, Fetterman, uh, you're... Uh, Next, uh, and uh, if, no, excuse me, Senator Fetterman, uh, uh, you are recognized, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, welcome, Thank thanks you. for coming. We got it, we had a, yeah. earlier today some, uh, com some comments about uh, the uh, tragic uh, accident in uh, 995, and if you want to make any comments with respect to that, feel, feel free, you're recognized. Uh, no, I, I, I uh, would, would, would just um, really like to, you know, the 95, 95, 95, you know, um, you know, obviously, the, you know, you're pretty much preoccupied with, with 95, and I, know, I certainly am too, and we know it's a major uh, eatery, not, not just for, for Pennsylvania, but for the East, the East Coast. And a lot of Pennsylvanians are worried that the delays and repairs bring to its standstill deal. I'm glad to see last night you were so quick to get $3 million to the emergency relief the funds got out so quickly. Just personally, like, it just seemed $3 million wasn't enough. <laughs> I mean, it, it seems like it's going to be even a lot more expensive uh, than, than, than that. But uh, I, I get the sense... You know, President Biden, you know, I was standing next to a collapsed bridge in western Pennsylvania, and things moved on really quickly and got it down. And I'm confident that the same is going to happen, you know, in, in east Pennsylvania uh, as, as, as well. 
But, but right now, you have an incredible uh, asset uh, in, in SIPTA, and it's the regional rail and subway lines that I think could be a game changer if SEPTA was still needs support to expand temporary capacity to ease congestion on the roads. And my, my question to you, Administrator, you know, could you emergency relief on other funds at your agency could help SEPTA's temporary operating costs to make transit a viable alternative for local travel? And will you commit to working with Secretary to get the SEPTA support in the next few weeks? Uh Thank you, Senator, and I know how important this uh, uh, project is, and uh, Senator, uh, uh, Chairman Carper had reached out to me uh, uh, on Sunday and I know had uh, connected us. I know you're very engaged on this. Um, with specifically to the, the $3 million on the quick release, um, all of the costs of this uh, will be borne uh, through the emergency relief uh, program. The, the $3 million is sort of a down payment. It's about a 10%. Uh, estimate of what they think they're going to need. Uh, if that number goes up, we'll provide more funding. Yeah. Uh, but that was the the reason uh, for the three million. Um, uh, specifically on SEPTA, uh, I was with uh, Leslie Richards, who is the general manager of SEPTA yesterday. Secretary Buttigieg was briefed on that. Um, we and again back to this concept of following the law. Uh, Federal Highway ER funds uh, specifically relate to added capacity on SEPTA, and we are working to stand that up. Uh, Secretary Buttigieg has also asked us to look with FTA what uh, provisions they may have, but SEPTA is a, is a critical link here for, the, for that corridor. Yeah. Right. While I'm here, I also want to talk about the federal government's dragging its feet in implementing expert advice and making st streets safer as, as well. And, and, and so I reached out twice to express my concerns about the actions of your agency should be taking uh, making streets safe and frustration delays have been witnessing with some key guidelines. Uh, when can we expect that these actions will be finalized and will commit to working with my office to address the concerns that I've raised? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I think, uh you know, Secretary Buttigieg is very clear that safety is our number one priority, uh, and, and as part of the National Roadway Safety Strategy, safe streets, uh, safe design, safer speeds, these are all things that we talk about uh, uh, incessantly within Federal Highways, so happy to follow up with your staff around any concerns you may have raised so that we can more quickly uh, deploy safety in our system. Okay, thank you. And I look forward to your response for my other questions, so th thank you, thank you very much, Administrator. Thank you, sir. And I cede my, my balance to the chair. Uh, the, the chair is happy to have it. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, well, uh, we'll, come, we'll turn to the, uh, the issue of I-95, I'm, I'm sure a little bit later in, in the hearing, but thank you, Senator uh, Federman. Okay, I think, uh, Senator Lummis, you're next and follow, following you is Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, truck parking. Uh, I have a bill with Senator Kelly uh, called the Truck Parking Safety Improvement Act, where we're going to authorize some additional funding uh, to your agency to address the backlog. But as we continue to debate that bill, um, I'm interested to hear uh, what work are you doing now on this issue? Uh, thank you, Senator Lummis. And uh, I remember when I was a Colorado DOT director, we would get uh, the closure notices for I-80 often, uh, and we would start reaching out to our commercial vehicle partners to let them know that they didn't need to come up, uh, and we're trying to stop them in uh, before they got up and got stacked up too much. So this is a critical issue for us. Uh, I would say this is an eligibility that we have extended uh, through our formula funds, and there are even discretionary grants that have been awarded that involve truck parking. So I know this is something that uh, myself and Secretary Buttigieg are supportive of. Well, thank you. We just had an absolutely outrageous winter in Wyoming this year. And uh, road closures were extremely common and uh, I think are uh, bound to continue to be so. You know the challenges of that uh, high plains environment. Um, okay, I want to switch to the Inflation Reduction Act a little bit, a few questions about that. So last year, um, I had major concerns regarding the program that the IRA created 
uh, it's called the Neighborhood Access and Equity Grant Program. Uh, my concerns there are, I don't want it just to be a way to funnel taxpayer dollars to urban areas and neglect rural areas. Can you give me some assurance that that's not happening? Or, or, or do you have a, some information about how that money's going out? How's it being awarded? Uh, thank you, Senator. Obviously, for any of the discretionary programs, we will issue a notice of funding opportunity that uh, has great detail uh, uh, and prescribes how we award the funding. I'm quite certain we've got examples of rural communities uh, that have uh, received funds, and so I'd be happy to follow up uh, with you um, uh, directly after the hearing. Super. I'll look forward to that. Um, and I want to touch on some issues yet that uh, were also discussed by uh, Senator Sullivan. Uh, the environmental review system is effectively broken, and it really affects uh, highway dollars because of the massive increase in inflation uh, in the construction industry. It exceeds inflation in other areas of our economy, so delays in uh, construction are hugely costly. Um, so I've introduced a bill, the, it's called the Interactive Federal Review Act, uh, and it's to test interactive cloud-based platforms that are estimated to shorten the time spent reviewing the documents for large projects by as much as half. Uh, so have you had a chance to uh, look at this idea, and do you believe a step like that could help expedite, expedite project delivery? Yeah, Senator Lemus, um, thank you for, uh, for, those, uh, for that comment and that work. I, uh, I was in the private sector before I came to uh, this role, and uh, uh, digital delivery, digital tools for construction and bringing all of that uh, digital NEPA uh, uh, processes, I think, are something that are very exciting. So happy to work with your uh, office on that. Just on the inflation piece, uh, you know, I, I was in a global transportation role, and I would just say inflation is a huge issue in America for our transportation projects, but issue inflation was also an issue in the Middle East around transportation projects, in the UK, mm -hmm. in Asia. I mean, there's, there's sort of a global uh, uh, issue with commodities uh, now, and so I just wanted to highlight that, that it, uh, it's a challenge we're dealing uh, globally, not just here in the US. Good point. Uh, I want to run another <clears throat> thing by you that also deals with uh, these types of delays. Um, Congress updated the categorical exclusion, exclusion in the IIJA for projects with limited federal funding, uh, $6 million. So now that inflation has made a $6 million contribution of federal funds to a project, uh, such a small contribution that you can't effectively use categorical exclusions. Um, I'm inclined to want to raise the uh, CADEX uh, amount to like 12 million, double it, so it can be meaningfully used instead of uh, being almost irrelevant. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Uh, thank you, Senator. Happy to uh, uh, work with your staff to evaluate what that right number would be. We want to be able to use a, a CE whenever possible. And I think, you know, your notes on inflation, uh, I'm very focused on project delivery. And if we can deliver these projects on time, it's going to help on the inflation issue as well. And can I ask one more question about that? No. In your experience, no, go ahead. In your experience does, um, what advantages does it give a project? to qualify for a categorical exclusion? Uh, so, uh, so from from my experience, if you can issue, a, if you can get a CE, uh, then you're, you're not looking at doing the higher levels of uh, environmental review, but that's always correlated with the impacts uh, to a project, right? So, um, uh, you know, if it's, a, if it's a major bridge project that has water impacts and, you know, potentially some tribal impacts or other uh, issues there, that's, that's where you're going to start to add time and review because there's just greater impacts from a project. But the structural integrity of the project 
has to be evaluated regardless of whether you have a CADEX or not. So, uh, thank you, Senator. So structural design elements uh, would be different than the environmental exactly. uh, uh, impacts that, uh, of a project. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Senator Lamas, thanks, as always, for, uh, for joining us. Uh, Senator Kelly, good morning. Thank Welcome. you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Administrator Bott, thanks again for being here and great to see you. I want to start by discussing uh, a project to widen Interstate 10, which uh, goes through Arizona, goes all the way across the country, in fact, but uh, the area between Phoenix and Tucson is a problem. Um, every single day, uh, there is an accident that backs up this stretch of highway for hours. Um, and it's because there are portions of this highway that are just two lanes in, in each direction. And it is a major safety issue. Um, it's also worth noting that this stretch of roadway that I'm talking about is within the Gila River Indian community. Yet the infrastructure does not currently exist to adequately connect the community to this critical transportation corridor. You know, fortunately, uh, the Arizona Department of Transportation, the Gila River Indian community, and local leaders from throughout Maricopa, Pinal, and Pima counties in the state of Arizona have come together to support a comprehensive plan to add an extra lane to the interstate in each direction and add several critical interchanges to improve connectivity for the Gila River Indian community. To date, the state of Arizona and the Maricopa Association of Governments have committed more than $850 million in state and local transportation funding to complete this project. It's a lot of money. Uh, we're hoping to make up the remainder of the funding with either an infra or a mega grant this year. Administrator that can you provide any indication of when you expect the notice of funding opportunity for the infra and mega grants? Uh, thank you, Senator Kelly, and I'm very aware both of the importance of that interstate to those communities, uh, Phoenix and Tucson, and then also as a freight, vital freight corridor for the United States. Uh, I am Happy to be in contact with uh, Director Toth as well, um, if that would be helpful. Uh, I will give you specifics, but we, we have so many of these NOFOs that are coming out. Uh, but again, I would believe that that would be one that would be coming out in the next, uh, in the summer time frame as well. Okay, sometime in the summer. Can you get back to us with a specific date? Absolutely, sir. Back to my office, thank you. As you know, uh, we applied for one of these, one of the mega grants last year for this specific project. Uh, we didn't receive it. After that decision, I heard concerns from some in Arizona that the project was not selected in favor of some multimodal projects. Well, I know you cannot comment on a specific project. Can you speak more broadly about whether projects to expand interstates, especially in fast-growing states like Arizona, could be competitive for a future mega or an infra grant award? Uh, thank you, Senator. I think that um, what what uh, we always want to make sure is that I think we think that you know states and locals are the ones who make the best decisions about their transportation uh, needs, and uh, happy to work with uh, those communities. Um, and I think on Mega, I think we're 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 probably weeks, not months, away uh, on Mega. Um, yeah, from a look, I, I'd be happy to. Is there any reason why a uh, adding additional lanes to an interstate would not qualify for a mega grant? Uh, I know there are there are some of the carbon reduction uh, program grants that specifically forbid it, but there is nothing expressly in the law that would prevent uh, a, a capacity um, under some of these programs. Okay, and um, you know, last year there were nine mega grants awarded. I think that was the number and. None of these projects, we took a look at them closely, none of them appeared to be located on tribal land or meaningfully serve tribal communities. So can you speak to the work that, the federal, that federal Highways is doing to ensure that tribal communities are able to apply for and be competitive 
for grant funding opportunities like the Mega and Infra grants? Uh, thank you, Senator. And uh, you know, I worked closely with the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe in Colorado when I was the director there, and I'm, I'm aware of the, the sometimes the unique circumstances uh, there. We have a tribal technical assistance program uh, that uh, that we work directly with tribes to help them um, apply. And happy to uh, connect with your office to provide more details. Helping them apply does that also help them be competitive? I, 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 I believe those two would be synonymous, but uh, um, I, I want to just double check. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, uh, thank you, Senator, uh, Senator Capito. Yes, thank you. Uh, I wanted to go back to one of the questions that I had uh, asked you about the safety on uh, EVs, and we talked about the weight limits, so my crack staff got me this uh, from um, uh, NTSB head uh, Hamandi was uh, was quoted as saying the Ford's uh, F-150 Lightning EV pickup is two to three thousand pounds heavier than the same model's combustion version, and the Mustang Mach E electric SUV and the Volvo EC40 EV, she said, are about 33 percent heavier than their gasoline ca counterparts. So this is an issue, and so I would just encourage you at the department, among all of your other things, is to look at uh, as this increases in a number of EVs, what it's gonna do to our safety impacts on the highway, because I think it will have an impact. We, we know weight has impact on damages. Um, I wanna ask about Buy America. Uh, I'm understanding that there are inconsistencies with the implementation of Buy America, Build America, provisions that we put into the IIJA, and it's kinda got a patchwork of state implementation challenges, causing some confusion. So FHWA will play a major role in the Buy America waiver process. If not handled, this could become, uh, this could bring some of our projects to a halt. And I'm hearing Buy America on all kinds of different issues, and it goes back to the supply issues that uh, Senator Lomas was talking about. Um, can you talk about the waiver process at FHWA and how you're preparing and what kind of the, for the influx of requests that are going to be coming in the future as this market tightens? Uh, thank you. Uh Ranking member, uh -huh. and uh, yes, your crack staff, uh, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> provides you with uh, a lot of information. Um, I would say very specifically on uh, the Buy America, you know, when I hear the president speak, uh, I think I hear him talking about the transformational aspects of the law and building projects and, and improving our infrastructure. And with equal passion, I hear the president talk about rebuilding the economy and ensuring that these are good paying American jobs and these products are built here. And so there is a, uh, as we are rebuilding our industrial capacity around some of these projects that are being reshored now and uh, we're getting battery plants built here, uh, there is going to be a, a tension between getting projects built quickly uh, and then getting those projects uh, made with products that are made here in America. And so we're just going to have to um, find a way to thread this needle of ensuring that you know we're getting projects done quickly and then finding appropriate waivers to make that happen, but making sure that we're also rebuilding the industrial capacity. Are you here finding in the a larger influx of requests for waivers? Uh, uh, ranking member, I would say that I would have to go back and double check, but yes, generally we are hearing. And uh, you have this, do you have the mechanisms set up to be able to address that growing challenge within the department? Uh, yes, so every um, waiver request that would come in, we have a process for you do. evaluating. Yes. Okay. Let me ask about one federal decision because that's, I've been touting that as a, a way to streamline, and obviously it's, it was in the debt. Uh, uh, the debt bill that we just passed for other projects. And uh, I, there's concern, I think, and, uh, you know, are, are the, are we, has this been implemented enough to really make a difference? Uh, are you seeing more streamlined uh, implementation on these projects? You would know, coming from the state sector, whether it's moving faster. How many projects are on track to achieve that two-year goal of uh, for for the EISs, you know, are you utilizing the provision uh, that requires one environmental document? I mean, talk about one federal decision, your implementation, and and some of these specifics that I've mentioned. Yeah, thank you, ranking member, and 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 I would say as a uh, as somebody with a project delivery background, I appreciate right. these efforts. Uh, you know, um, to just get greater clarity and uh, accelerate project delivery. Um, 
I am happy to come back with very specific uh, lists of projects that that we're um, you know implementing uh, some of these reviews on. I would I would say like for all of these major projects, these are big thorny issues. I think this is one of the areas where uh, Mitch Landrieu, uh, who uh, works directly for the president uh, on project delivery, is constantly saying, how can we get these agencies to work uh, together better? So I would say that we have great awareness and great cooperation with the resource agencies. Um, and right now, it's just a matter of uh, getting through some of the processes so we can get to these uh, decisions uh, in a more quick way. Are you seeing the end result here yet? of this one federal decision? Uh, I, would, I would say that I, I personally can think of examples uh, where we are actively engaging with um, resource agencies proactively. We're talking about the timelines that have been established. Um, I've been in the rule for six months, so I, I don't know if I can say that I've, I've got a project that went from start to finish in that two-year time frame. Okay. okay, so we need to keep keep following up on that. And then lastly, uh, you testified that uh, FHWA is administering nearly 900 awards, and this sort of follows on to that one federal decision. Do, I mean, I, I guess we could follow up with you and your staff more specifically, how many of those awards actually have project grant agreements in place? Is, is it, are we getting to the end point here? I mean, you have a lot going on, I under, we understand that, but are the awards being made in a timely fashion to satisfy you? Because we're hearing some blowback on that. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member. So we are working very closely with any of the uh, award recipients to make sure that the, there's a grant agreement in place that we are gonna get them successfully uh, because some of these programs have uh, construction timeframes around obligation or getting money obligated within timeframes. And so we wanna make sure uh, and happy to provide you uh, and your staff with any um, uh, timelines and updates on yeah, project we, we, lists. We would like some specific data on that following up on your on your opening statement. But thank you for being here and thank you for everything that you're doing. Appreciate it. Thanks, Senator Capito. Um, I've got a couple of questions and then right at the end I'm going to return to uh, I-95 and any any uh, any last thoughts you have, especially in uh, on the wake of what I think the governor of Pennsylvania has announced earlier here today. Um, I, uh, first, uh, a question dealing with uh, EV charging standards. And uh, this week, uh, Ford and General Motors announced that they will rely on Tesla's uh, charging technology for their electric vehicles as well. And since those three uh, companies together represent, I think, about 75% of EV sales in the U.S., this indicates some industry consolidation around the North American uh, charging standards or, or, or NACs. Uh, Federal Highway Administration rules will require companies seeking uh, EV charging grants from uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law to use a, an alternate standard, the combined charging system or CCS. Question, how does the uh, existence of multiple industry standards affect the uh, build out of EG charging infrastructure, and what is the role of the, your agency, F, FHWA's role in facilitating convergence around a single standard? And sort of a corollary to that is, additionally, if a single charging technology emerges as an industry standard, how will Federal Highway Administration make sure that it's uh, open, accessible, and reliable for all EVs? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Senator, and uh, uh, thank you, Chairman Carper. And I think that uh, um, a couple of things. I think that the um, I think the public should recognize that the coalescing of Ford, Tesla, and GM, uh, kind of a new big three uh, on uh, on EVs, uh, is is in no small part due to the investments that have been made by the bipartisan infrastructure law, President Biden's focus on this, and uh, it is great to see private sector um, uh, coming together and, and working to get a standard, right? I think that's part of our challenge as we're rolling out this new program is we're making live decisions and the world is moving and evolving as we move forward. And as somebody who has a, an electric vehicle that has a uh, CCS uh, charger, I, I wanna make sure that I'm able to charge. I think one of the things that we're reassured by is that there are adapters that are available, right? So if 
if for some reason the industry moves in a in a in a in a certain direction, um, this is not like a very finite. Like you either have to choose one or the other right now. Um, but uh, we are, I think, excited to see industry coming together, and uh, uh, we'll work with our public sector partners to make sure that we're trying to move in concert as much as possible. Good. As a, an electric vehicle owner, uh, I feel uh, the same the same sentiment that you've just expressed. Uh, climate uh, title uh, rollout. Uh, the uh, the threat of climate change means uh, we must uh, urgently reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're trying to do that, and just as urgently ensure that our transportation systems are resilient to the inevitable increase in natural disasters that are already being witnessed across the country. Uh, I strongly uh, support the inclusion of an historic climate title in the bipartisan infrastructure law, including discretionary grants to build out EV charging in communities and to increase resilience. Um, I'm somewhat concerned, though, ha having said that, that these discretionary grant uh, programs have been slow to be implemented and that no funds, I'm told, no funds have been awarded yet. Here's my question. Does uh, Federal Highway Administration have the staff resources that it needs to promptly begin awarding grants and meet the urgency of the moment in implementing the climate title? Uh, thank you, Chairman Carper. I think that uh, one of the things that I've been very focused on is turning awards into projects. Uh, since I've been coming here, I know that uh, Secretary Buttigieg is also very focused on this. I'll just give you one very specific example. Uh, on CFI, we had initially had a deadline uh, in May uh, for uh, those uh, communities to submit their applications. And because we got a lot of requests uh, for more time, because you know these communities wanted uh, you know to be successful in applying, we actually extended the deadline to June 13th. So. Some of it is us. It's a there's a lot of new programs, federal highways, staff, and again, I that was I, yesterday. I, what's that? Just yesterday. Yes. Right. Yeah. There's a lot going on. You know, there's a lot going on. But yes, yesterday uh, was the deadline there. But again, I can't stress this enough. I think federal highway staff, since the this law was enacted, have been working around the clock uh, to get all of these programs uh, stood up, uh, and we will continue uh, to work like that. But it's a balance of. Uh, we, we want to move uh, swiftly, uh, but also thoughtfully to get to successful outcomes. Yeah. I, and this, is, I think you've in part answered this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, how is Federal Highway Administration working with states to ensure that states prioritize investments in EV charging infrastructure? Uh, thank you, Chairman Carper. Yes, I think uh, we have a robust discussion with our state partners around NEVI, uh, you know, approving their plans, uh, looking at um, some of the exceptions that they've they've asked for uh, as they you know look to stand up these alternative fuel corridors. I think uh, just like when the interstate system was built, uh, we want to make sure that the, this EV network is one that Americans can go coast to coast uh, and community to community uh, without fear of, of not being able to charge. Oh, good. Um, bus rapid transit. I remember the first time I heard of this program, I thought, well, that's a clever idea. I wish I'd come up with that. But the, uh, the uh, uh, bus rapid transit systems uh, provide, as you know, fast, uh, I think in many cases, reliable, high quality public transportation. Uh, routes and they're being adopted, I'm happy to see, in cities uh, across the country and uh, offer a way to connect in, in part suburbs to job centers and to expand access to rail networks, among other things. The bipartisan infrastructure law uh, provides uh, new eligibility for states to use uh, formula dollars to build bus rapid transit systems. I think this may have been raised when I, I was out of the uh, room attending my other uh, Markov on their business meeting, my other committee, but I missed this. But how is the uh, Federal Highway Administration providing information to states about the uh, opportunities to build bus rapid transit systems? And a corollary to that, in general, how is Federal Highway Administrating, the Administration coordinating with the Federal Transit Administration to facilitate multimodal investments? Uh, Thank you, Chairman Carper. Uh, you know, when I was a uh, Delaware secretary, we also ran DTC, so very familiar um, with transit operations. And I would say that from a federal highway perspective, um, you know, we are constantly making states aware of their, and, and I think the states are aware uh, of their eligibility for flexing uh, highway dollars uh, for transit. Uh, we work very closely, Nuri and I, uh, Nuri, uh, the FTA administrator, are 
uh, often in close communication, the Secretary's office. Uh, I think we, we're, we're bringing a multimodal approach more so than any other Department of Transportation uh, has had that uh, focus. All right, thank you. We've, um, we talked earlier about the um, uh, alarmingly uh, high number of uh, pedestrians uh, who are dying uh, in this country. And, and the, I think the uh, fatality level is reached its high, highest level in decades, maybe 40, 40 years or so. And uh, those uh, and the fatalities increased during the pandemic because uh, despite an overall uh, decrease in driving, people just drove less, but the, uh, the, we saw, uh, continue to see an increase. But, but the bipartisan infrastructure law invests, as you know, heavily in safety, uh, particularly for pedestrians, for bicyclists, and other vulnerable road uh, users. And it also directs USDOT to reconsider some of the manuals and procedures uh, that govern road uh, design. USDOT has also released a safety strategy that recognizes the danger that high speeds and overbuilt road designs pose to vulnerable road uh, users. Question, how has the US uh, DOT safety strategy informed Federal Highway Administration and the administration's implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law? And is Federal Highway Administration uh, considering or reconsidering design guides and procedures to discourage higher speeds? Uh, thank you, Chairman Carper. I think that uh, Secretary Buttigieg often uh, speaks about the, um, his focus on safety. Uh, the National Roadway Safety Strategy incorporates safe design, safer speeds uh, into this. And, and I, I think as a Federal Highway Administrator, what I often tell our, our folks and our state partners is we need to um, differentiate our interstate system from where those interstates become arterials and those arterials become city streets. And uh, I spoke at NACTO earlier this year, and we really want to partner with communities you know, who want to uh, enact lower speed limits in, their, uh, in these cities. Um, you know, I think what we're learning sort of globally is that the, uh, the cities that get the best outcomes and the safest cities are the ones where you know, people feel safe to walk and bike. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that you know, we're not just thinking about moving cars and trucks, but you know, we're creating these places where people feel safe uh, to be active uh, in their transportation. All right, thank you. Um, I, uh, I have just given a hand and a notice that if I want to ask questions at the Finance Committee, hearing this going on right now, I need to uh, wrap this up. But before we do that, uh, the uh, governor of uh, Pennsylvania, Governor Shapiro, has made some uh, announcements uh, this morning that I think are relevant uh, to uh, uh, the, uh, the discussion we're having today. And if you could uh, just you know, share with us just briefly what he's announced and uh, a re reaction, your reaction to what he's announced, uh, I'd appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, Chairman Carper. And uh, yes, uh, I, I, I've been in the hearing, so I'm not sure specifically what he uh, announced, but it was my understanding that uh, he was going to detail uh, the timeline for the expected repair. And I think that where uh, we were uh, thinking it might be several months, I think that PennDOT has come up with an expedited plan. I was part of those discussions uh, yesterday, but I think it's going to be an innovative fix that will uh, get us uh, to a resolution much quicker and restore traffic on I-95, which is, uh, you know, crippling the, that region uh, right now. And so just really grateful for the innovation uh, of PennDOT and the cooperation of Philadelphia uh, and uh, our regional partners and the Federal Highway Administration. Great. Any question that you hadn't been asked that you'd like to be asked? I, I have several, sir, but I want you to get to your finance uh, right. committee before. Right. Right. My staff will appreciate that. Uh, I, I just want to say how... Uh, what a uh, joy it's been to sit here today and to uh, hear, hear from you and to hear uh, your responses to the questions that have been asked. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, for the uh, other people who may not know this, way, I was given the opportunity to suggest uh, folks uh, to the uh, a new, newly elected president a couple of years ago to people to serve in his administration. And uh, Shailen Bott was one of the people I was especially pleased to, uh, to, to recommend. And uh, sitting here listening to you today, respond to questions and doing a really f a forthright and, and frank way, knowledgeable way, uh, makes, me, uh, uh, makes me very happy. And uh, to your family who are sharing you with uh, all of us across the country, give them uh, your wife and your, you have one child, is that? 
two daughters. Two daughters, two, two girls. To, uh, tell them that uh, we appreciate them sharing their husband and, and dad with uh, the rest of us, all right? And let's see here, I think, some boilerplate that I have to, uh, to mention. In closing, in closing, I want to thank uh, our witness, uh, Administrator Shailen Bott, Bott and Souls, for his uh, time and testimony uh, today. And as we've uh, heard today, the Federal Highway Administration faces no shortage of important work as it continues to implement the critical programs that are authorized and funded by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Alliance, uh, by in part by the Inflation Reduction Act. And we thank you for your willingness to serve, to lead the Federal Highway Administration at this pivotal time for rebuilding America's transportation infrastructure. And we'd ask that you convey to the, the team that lead, the team, team members that you lead across the country, our, our, our thanks, bipartisan thanks for the good work that's being done. Everything I do, I know we can do better. I think the same is true for Federal Highway Administration. We just, uh, I know, what does it say in the Constitution, in order to form a more perfect union in the preamble? Uh, we're never gonna be perfect, uh, but that's, uh, that's our goal, and we're gonna continue to strive to do that, and we appreciate the spirit in which you lead this agency. Thank you, and I think uh, uh, Senator's gonna be now allowed to submit uh, written rec uh, questions for the record. Uh, through the close of business on Wednesday, June 28th, and we'll compile those questions. That's two weeks from today. We'll compile those questions, send them to the Federal Highway Administration, and ask that they be responded to by, by you and your team by Wednesday, July the 12th. And with that, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you so much.